Hello everyone. I am Dr. V. Mohan, Chairman of Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Specialty Center and a Senior Diabetologist uh, of India. As we all know, this COVID-19 has completely turned our lives uh, topsy-turvy and everybody's mind, there is only one thought and that is COVID from the time we get up in the morning till the time we go to bed. We are all thinking, talking, sleeping uh, about COVID-19. But one interesting thing which has come out from this COVID-19 is the diabetes connection. Uh, because we know from China and from, we know from other places where COVID-19 has really reached epidemic proportions that uh, one of the important comorbidities in people who have serious COVID-19 infection is diabetes. So what do we know about diabetes and COVID-19? And this webinar is all about that. I must confess that we don't know an awful lot about it, but I'll try to share with you the scientific facts as we know about the connection between diabetes and COVID-19. Those are my credentials. And I'd like to start with a disclaimer uh, that this is a pure educational talk for medical and other healthcare professionals, especially those who may treat COVID patients. And these are not recommendations of any sort and I would strongly advise you to go to your local state and central public health websites uh, like the uh, ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, the Ministry of Health, the WHO, the Center for Chronic Diseases or the CDC, among many others. The state governments are also putting out uh, various uh, statements and those are the official statements. So some of the numbers that I share with you may not be the official or the latest ones. So this is just purely for an educational purpose. And I'd like to start with one more disclaimer. And that is, I think, the most important message that I want to give you all. Do not panic because COVID-19 is not going to be the end of the world. We are all going to survive this. This too shall pass. And therefore, I want to give you a motivational address and tell you, just stay calm, behave responsibly. I am talking mainly to doctors. Many of you are in the front line of COVID-19. And if you take precautions, it is very unlikely that you will get COVID-19 infection yourself uh, or succumb to it or develop morbidity or mortality due to this. So please don't panic. I feel, see many of my colleagues uh, panicking and thinking that uh, you know the worst days, the doom days have arrived and the world is going to end. Nothing like that, just as we saw with SARS and uh, MERS and all other uh, infections, Ebola or Nipah or whatever, uh, this too will become very soon a thing of the past. So on that optimistic note, uh, let me just thank uh, Professor Shashank Joshi, a very good friend of mine and a senior colleague from Bombay, from Leelawati, Apollo Sugars and uh, Bhatia Hospital in Mumbai. He was kind enough to put together a lot of slides on diabetes. Of course, this was a general talk on COVID-19. Uh, but I wrote to him and got some of the slides which I'll be using. So thank you, Shashank, for your help. So let's start at the very beginning. Why talk about COVID-19 and diabetes? There were some initial reports, as I mentioned, from China and from other countries, which showed that patients with associated hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes have higher mortality. Now, let me pause here and tell you that COVID-19 has been shown to affect and become more serious in older people, okay? And if you take older people, then most of them will have diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. And this is something which you all know as doctors. I can share with you the data from India that we have. At age, let's say 60 and beyond, in the studies that we have done, and also in collaboration with Dr. Nikhil Tandon from All India Institute and so on, we published lots of papers on the epidemiology of diabetes and hypertension uh, in India, both urban and rural. And if you look at metropolitan cities where this disease has been mostly detected, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Bangalore, Mumbai, and so on, uh, Chennai, and so on, the, at age 60, almost 40% of people have diabetes and 35% have pre-diabetes. So 75% of people at age 60 and above have uh, diabetes or pre-diabetes. Hypertension prevalence is even more common than in diabetes. I would expect 
60 to 70 percent of people above 60 years of age would have hypertension and a large number of them will also have cardiovascular disease because cardiovascular disease is very common in indians so when you're talking about older people getting covid 19 to me it is hardly surprising that there is a lot of diabetes hypertension and cardiovascular disease because you're treating an older age group please keep this in mind when you look at all the statistics that i'm going to present to you but we do know apart from that that hyperglycemia increases the risk of all infections with bacterial infection fungal infection uh, viral infection we're not so sure but definitely yes probably all infections due to the deranged immunity and we'll talk a little bit about that and the good point is that if you control your diabetes well we all know about the hba1c test the three months control test if you keep that within seven percent this risk for a person with diabetes comes down to the level of a person without diabetes so the good news is that people have the diabetes under control you really don't have to worry and the same thing for hypertension remember that diabetes is not the only disease which contributes to immune suppression there are other endocrine diseases and the role of adrenal and pituitary in immunity are well known and thymic endocrinology is an important part of the discipline which relates to the fact that the very few children get this uh, disease so it's possible that the thymic uh, humoral factor which mediates immunity to viruses may play a role in protecting children from covid 19 of course having said that it does affect children except that the prognosis is much better infectious disease specialists and other healthcare professionals in all covid 19 should be aware of these nuances of endocrinology uh, because they should be aware that uh, people with some endocrine diseases diabetes top of the list are more prone to these infections now Coming directly to the question, or because people ask me all the time, I've had several TV interviews and so on, where people have asked me directly, are people with diabetes more likely to get COVID-19? I would say no, actually no, because uh, COVID-19 is spread through droplet infection. So if somebody with COVID-19 was going to sneeze directly into somebody's face, it's very unlikely that only the diabetic people will get it and the people without diabetes uh, won't get it. So I don't think they're more prone to get it than the general population. But if you get it, because their immunity is slightly lower, they may get a worse outcome. I told you this is also because diabetes comes in slightly older people most of the time. You can get it in young people, of course, and we'll discuss that later. But with age itself, you have that. So we'll go into that uh, in a little more detail. Let's look at China. Of all the, where the most cases have occurred, now actually US is in number one position. I think Italy has gone to number two and China has gone to number three. So people with diabetes there had more serious complications. I'll show you the data about that. We won't belabor the point now. Uh, this is just a general, uh, you know, kind of a, a thing to, uh, to give you again a, a boost in your morale that as the, while the death roll, uh, toll can rise, as the number of cases increase, the percentage of people who actually get it uh, or who will be much more, and therefore the death rates will actually go down. From India, from the data that we have, the death rates are not at all more than in what has been reported in other countries. And remember, I'll give you on general statistics now, which you know, but it's worth repeating any number of times. Let's say 100 people, let's put it this way. Let's say 100 people with diabetes get COVID and 100 people without diabetes get COVID. Naturally, the 100 people with diabetes will get slightly worse prognosis. So that is well known. But let's take the whole population. Let's say 100 people get COVID-19. Out of that, 80 people may not even know they have it. It may be like having a cold. And I have a cold throughout the year. I have a perennial rhinitis. Any time of the year, I have a cold. So for me, if I get this in that, in that mild form, I will not even know what is an ordinary cold and what is not uh, an ordinary cold, what is COVID. So 80% of people may not even know. Okay, If you go and test them, you might pick up a lot of asymptomatic cases, but it really doesn't matter because it's going to subside for them in two, three days time. And we don't have enough kits to go around testing 1.3 billion people in India. Let's face it. Okay. Second is, out of the 20% who have a little bit more, what you call as moderate disease, only about 15% of those, only about 15% or so totally might need admission. Out of that, only 5% will need, say, an ICU admission. And out of that, only about 1% is going to die. Okay. And those who die, even today I was listening to some of the statistics and studying it very closely, most of them 
have some comorbid condition. First of all, the death rates are 60%, 65% in males and 35% in females. So we're trying to analyze why is it males are succumbing more because of things like smoking, alcohol intake, and so on. And if you look at the people who died, especially in India, a lot of them already have kidney disease, severe diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, very old people, immunity very low. They already have chronic obstructive lung disease. So if you have all these conditions, on top of that, already your and what they've also worked out is that those who died, many of them would have died anyway within a year or two because their condition was quite bad. This is a, like the last straw on the camel's back, so to speak. So anyway, they are in a very bad position. And then they have one more severe respiratory infection, which took them. If you look at it that way, influenza also kills. In fact, probably influenza kills more people than COVID-19. So why I'm telling you all this is don't panic. Because just because a few people in India got it, or even if it goes to a few thousand people, it is a very, very, very small percentage. The chance of you getting it is very, very low. So let's remember that. Now, uh, as I already told you, the risk of infection, especially influenza, pneumonia, is higher in people with diabetes. People with diabetes above the age of two years are therefore recommended pneumococcal and annual influenza vaccination. We used to do it all the time. Now we have started encouraging people to do this. Why? Because if you already have an influenza and on top of that you get COVID, though nobody prevents you from getting two uh, viral illnesses, then the prognosis is worse. Or take another situation. You have COVID-19, you're admitted in hospital, but now you, have, you develop a, or when I say you, I mean your patient, develops a pneumococcal infection, secondary infection on top of that, the mortality could be more. So at least this can be prevented by using vaccination. So people with diabetes, I definitely recommend a pneumococcal vaccination, which is almost lifelong protection, and annually an influenza vaccination. We've been giving lots of these vaccinations the last few days after COVID-19 came. So diabetes is also associated with increased risk of infectious diseases and respiratory viruses. Now, if you look at the past history, we had the H1N1 uh, in 2009, the pandemic influenza A. Then we had the two coronaviruses have already come earlier. This is the third one. First is called SARS. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. And uh, next one we had was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus or the MERS-CoV. Now, both these, luckily in India, we are not very much affected, but uh, we know that in both these infections, people who had diabetes, the mortality rates were a little uh, higher. We have limited data about COVID-19 and people with diabetes, which I will share with you. Now, I have put down, this is my own slide, I have put down the potential mechanisms by which diabetes may increase the risk of COVID-19. First is age, and I already alluded to that. The second is that diabetic patients also have hypertension and heart disease. So that can make them more prone to COVID disease. Third is hyperglycemia itself. I told you that hyperglycemia reduces your immunity. Now these are what are called as clinical factors. Apart from this, there are immunological factors in people with diabetes. And I've listed uh, four such conditions. There's a higher affinity cellular binding and an efficient virus entry. Because of the higher affinity cellular binding, uh, the virus can enter easily. Second, people with diabetes, they don't clear the viruses easily. So they decrease viral clearance. Third is a diminished T cell function. We know that because of the immunological uh, defect in diabetic patients, the T cell function, the T cell function is supposed to, uh, the T helper cells are supposed to get rid of all the viruses and bacteria. That is diminished. And finally, there's an increased susceptibility to hyper inflammation and what is called a cytokine storm. I told you that the majority of patients have a mild disease. Some, I told you, it becomes a little more moderate and in a few, it becomes severe. When it becomes severe, then it leads to pneumonia and that can then lead to ARDS and, and multiple organ failure and so on. They have now found out that in these people in whom it becomes very severe, there is what is called as a cytokine storm. Number of cytokines are released in large quantities and the body is not able to tolerate that. That leads to liver failure, kidney failure, uh, of course, to lung failure uh, and so on. 
I talked about the elderly uh, being more prone. Why is that? When you're young, you have a robust immune function. Uh, there's a high vaccination efficiency, high resistance to infections. In the elderly, on the other hand, there's a decline in immune function. There's a lower vaccination efficiency, the decreased immune surveillance, there's a decreased resistance to infections, there's an increased onset of malignancy. That's the other thing that they have shown, another comorbidity. If you have cancers, already you're in an immunocompromised state, or you may be on chemotherapy or radiotherapy, those things can make you more prone. Increased inflammation and, of course, autoimmune activation. Now, are they coming back to the question, are they more likely to develop severe form of COVID-19? I would say, again, this is my view, that if the diabetes is uncontrolled, probably yes, because you're already setting the stage. You've got uncontrolled diabetes. Your immunity has gone down. Everything is at bad level. At that point, if you get COVID-19, probably yes. However, remember, the people with type 2 diabetes are usually older, and therefore, it could be the effect of age itself. And therefore, because of the diabetes and the age, the prognosis could be worse, but again, only in uncontrolled diabetes. I have looked at uh, the data of all the 56 uh, people, uh, who 53 people who died uh, in India so far, and I have not heard of a young, well-controlled person with diabetes dying so far. So it's not that everybody with diabetes is at risk. It's only the older people with very severe uncontrolled diabetes and other comorbidities who are more prone. Now, let's look at the data. This is a data published from China. It was published in Clinical Research and Cardiology, where the authors look at a series of uh, papers where they looked at uh, the COVID-19. And uh, these are about five or six uh, papers here. So if you look at the percentage of diabetics who had uh, the COVID, among the people with diabetes, those who had COVID-19, look at the numbers, however, it's 11, 99, 40. There's only one with more than 1,000 cases. But having said that, if you look at the percentage of people with diabetes, it's 10%, 27, 12, and so on. If you read between the lines, and so look at the mean age of these patients. If you look at the mean age of these patients, when the age is low, let us say, uh, 30, this one doesn't have any uh, report leave. That's only 11 cases. But this one, look at the mean age where it's below 50, okay? The one of the cases, uh, this one had only 41 cases. So you exclude that. Take this one, the large series, 1,000 cases, 47 years, only 7% had uh, diabetes. So it is low. Now, if you go to a slightly higher age group, you take 54 years, then 10% have diabetes. And then you go to 68 years and 12% have diabetes. So it is clear even from this small analysis that the older you are, you are more, more likely diabetes will be coexisting with uh, COVID-19. So definitely age is playing a uh, important factor here. Now, if you look at uh, the, uh, the result, the higher proportion, this one shows, looks at the ICU and looks at the severe cases, and I'll read this. Diabetes accounted for 11.7% of the ICU severe cases, but 4% of the non-ICU severe cases. So within the ICU, if you look at uh, whether uh, diabetes resulted in more severe disease, yes, there is a suggestion. But look at the p-value. It is p equal to 0 0.9. And look at the wide confidence interval, 0.88 to 5.9. Also, although the relative risk is twofold higher, uh, it is not statistically significant. So one cannot say from the results that we have that even the severe form of diabetes is actually uh, proven. It's still not proven. It's still a hypothesis. Here is uh, another uh, paper, Analysis of Myocardial Injury and Cardiovascular Disease in Critical Patients with New corona Coronavirus uh, Pneumonia. Uh, 150 patients, 24 critically ill and 126 non-critically ill patients. And here what they did was they did a series of tests. They did the uh, pro-BNP, cardiac proponent test, HSCRP, creatinine level, hemoglobin level. And they looked at the univariate and multivariate logistic analysis uh, to see whether uh, the uh, related factors of the COVID critical illness was present or not. So you can see here that if you look at diabetes in the non-critical group, it was 11.9%. In the critical group, it was 20%. So at prima facie, you would think that it is uh, more. But look at the p-value. It is not significant. 
So although there is a slight increase, it is not statistically significant. So we must conclude that really it's not associated with uh, critical illness. That is what scientifically you would uh, conclude. If you calculate the hazards ratios or the odds ratios and look at uh, how much diabetes contributes, 1.97 suggests that there's twofold higher risk of severe illness. But look at the p-value. It is not significant. Okay, and the multivariate regression, it goes away. So diabetes is not coming out in this particular analysis as being associated with severe disease. But this was published in the Chinese Journal of Cardiovascular Disease. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, the 1,099 uh, cases from 552 hospitals. What I want you to concentrate here is on the primary outcome endpoint. Okay, and this primary outcome was admission to an ICU, intensive care unit, the use of mechanical ventilation or death. Any one of these. So remember again, to repeat, admission to ICU, use of a ventilator or death. This is the primary endpoint. Again, here the mean age of the patient is only 47 years. And look at this. Now, forget about all patients. This is in the non-severe patients. It was 5.7% who had diabetes. And among the severe patients, it was 16.2. So definitely it was increased, but it was not significant. Here, in the patients meeting the primary endpoint, that is a death or ventilator or severe uh, disease admission to ICU, was definitely more in people with diabetes compared to those without diabetes. But again, you must remember that these are probably also older patients. So that could be a confounder. Now, here is a paper uh, which is published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2020. Small group, uh, but they looked at 52 critically ill adult patients with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pneumonia uh, who were admitted uh, to, uh, to Wuhan after this actually started between late December 2019 and January 26th. And they compared the survivors and the non-survivors and the data was analyzed uh, on February 9th. Now, again, if you look at the non-survivors, 22% uh, had diabetes compared to 10% of the survivors. Uh, here is a pub paper published in uh, JAMA uh, online on 24th of February 2020. Large number of cases, 72,000 cases from China. But look at the small print here. 44,000 patients were confirmed cases, okay, with a positive viral nucleic acid uh, test, okay. 16,000 were only suspected and 10,000 were clinically diagnosed but not proven. So in this, when they looked at the whole series, the case fatality was 2% overall. Look at in the young age group, below nine years, nil, nobody died. The children recovered completely. As you go older, look at 70 to 79 years, 8%. Above 80 years, 15%. Now let me put it to you, I'll ask you a question. Suppose somebody above 80 years, let's say an 85, 90 year old man got admitted in an ICU, not due to COVID-19, but due to some other pneumonia or to some other illness or to influenza. You think 10% will not die? Of course, the, they must be having other comorbidities. They may be having renal failure. The liver may not be in good condition. They may be anemic. They may be malnourished. So this, these are not alarming figures. So don't get frightened. Oh, 14% of all old people died. No of all those sick people who may not have lived anyway for a more than six months or one year, even if they did not have COVID-19, they are the people who died. You must remember that. But the reason I put up this slide is overall death rate is 2.3 and with diabetes 7.3. As I said, these 7.3% could have been older people as well. So based on this, let me now go to uh, what have the associations done so far? A few months have passed. A lot of water has flown under the bridge. So what are the different associations saying about this? I'll read it out because these are technical reports and I have to be very precise when I read it. This is updated on March 18th. So you can say it's only two weeks old. This is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, the ACE position statement regarding coronavirus, COVID-19 and people with diabetes. What they say is, and I'll read it out, recent studies have shown that of those hospitalized with severe disease, 22.2 to 26.9% reported living with diabetes. So that's the high prevalence in those who have severe disease. I already showed you the data. Then they say, diabetes and high glucose levels are associated with increased complications, respiratory failure and mortality in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. That's obvious from the facts that I've already told you. 
Um, then they say, because people with diabetes may also have other comorbidities such as organ failure and cardiovascular disease, it is imperative that they follow specific COVID-19 precautions and prevention guidance from the CDC and the WHO and their endocrinologist or healthcare providers. Towards the end of this uh, webinar, I'll give you uh, what I think we should be doing and telling our people with diabetes. The International Diabetes Federation, as you know, is the largest body of diabetes associations in the world. Now, what they say is that, and I quote, when people with diabetes develop viral infection, it can be harder to treat due to fluctuation in blood glucose levels and possibly the presence of diabetes complications. Older people and people with pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and asthma appear to be more vulnerable to becoming severely ill with the COVID-19 virus. When people with diabetes develop viral infection can be harder to treat due to fluctuations in blood glucose levels and possibly the presence of diabetes complications. This appears to be, there appears to be two reasons for this. Firstly, the immune system, I told you, talked to you about that. Immune system is compromised, making it harder to fight the virus and likely leading to longer recovery period. And secondly, the virus may thrive in an environment of elevated blood glucose. So again, I'm underlining the point. If you have uncontrolled diabetes, all this is valid to control the diabetes, both these points, the immune system will also improve and this elevated blood glucose also will not be there. What does the American Diabetes Association say? This is the, one of the biggest bodies of diabetes association in the whole world. So what the ADA says is that people with diabetes are not more likely to get COVID infection than the general population. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Unless somebody coughs into your face or you go and touch something where it is there, then even if you don't have diabetes, you're more likely, you're equally likely to get it. So people won't get it just like that because it's a droplet infection. People with diabetes do face a higher chance of experience serious complication of COVID-19. People with diabetes are more likely to experience severe symptoms and complication infected with the virus. If diabetes is well managed, the risk of getting severely sick from COVID-19 is about the same as the general population. Please note and please tell all your patients this. If diabetes is well managed, the risk of getting severely sick from COVID-19 is about the same as a general population. COVID-19 is proving to be a more serious illness than seen including people with diabetes. The risks are similar for people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Manufacturers are not reporting that COVID-19 is impacting access to insulin and other supplies. So do we have a global shortage of insulin? That's the other worry when you have infection like this. Till now, nobody has said anything like that. So we don't have to worry. Now, a little bit more scientific uh, thing, and then I'll end with some general uh, things. Um, there has been a report, and this came in Lancet uh, Respiratory Medicine, uh, which says that you know, the SARS has uh, several layers on it. And one of them is a spike protein, which it has. That's what you see this thing, kind of red thing sticking out uh, here. You can see this is the spikes. And uh, what has been shown is that certain receptors related to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, the ACE2 enzyme, which is located on the cell membrane, it kind of fits into the SARS-CoV-2 virus like this. You can see because it has this uh, kind of spike and this is a kind of a receptor, it goes and attaches to that. So when it attaches, what happens is the ACE2 is able to pull the uh, COV2, the SARS-CoV-2 or the corona COVID-19 uh, virus into uh, the cell. Uh, so this raises uh, many possibilities. Once this uh, hypothesis uh, was, uh, uh, was kind of enunciated, this led to further questions. Uh, so the question is that, so this is it. So it uh, kind of binds through the target cells, which is expressed by the lungs, intestine, kidney, and blood vessels. The expression of ACE2 substantially increase in patients with type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes who are treated with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And hypertension is also treated with ACE inhibitors and ARB, which results in upregulation of ACE2. So the immediate question which comes is, people with hypertension are using these ACE inhibitors and ARB. Is that why people with hypertension are getting more of the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 infection? And if so, the logical question is, should you stop using ACE inhibitors and ARBs? We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but we should also know that the thiazoldine, deon, those who are on pioglitazone, also upregulate the ACE2 and ibuprofen. 
so today we know that there is a definite uh, you know statement saying please don't use ibuprofen uh, if you have body pain or uh, any other pains because this can aggravate the covid 19 i would uh, even go as far as say with the thiazolid and also you have to be a little uh, careful because this can also uh, increase but these are probably more uh, theoretical uh, now uh, uh, therefore when this particular thing comes should we be using the ACE inhibitors or ARBs at all? Uh, so what then came was that uh, since uh, the ACE2 has, this is a little controversial because uh, ACE2 actually reduces inflammation. And therefore, uh, the ACE inhibitors have been used for inflammatory lung disease, cancers, diabetes, hypertension, these kind of thing. So with this, the Lancet paper made this hypothesis, but it's only a hypothesis needs to be investigated that uh, should you be looking at the ACE and uh, ARB. A PubMed search was done, but it did not show uh, that, uh, you know, these things were bad. Uh, although there was one report saying that the calcium channel blockers are probably also good in case you're stopping any of the ACE or ARB, but I don't think you should because two associations, the American Heart Association on March 17 and the European Society of Cardiology of ESC on uh, March 13 issued these statements and I'll read it. Patients taking ACE inhibitors and ARBs who contract COVID-19 should continue treatment unless otherwise advised by their physician. And the European uh, Society of Cardiology, the Council on Hypertension strongly recommends that physicians and patients should continue treatment with the usual anti-hypertensive therapy because no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest the treatment of the ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be discontinued because of the COVID-19 infection. There was a nice paper written by Dr. Anup Mishra, uh, A.K. Singh, Ritesh Gupta, uh, where they have uh, written a kind of a commentary or an editorial which says clinical consideration patients with diabetes in times of COVID-19 epidemic. And since it's very well written, I'll take a few points from there. Uh, what these authors say that it's important that people with diabetes maintain good glycemic control as it might help in reducing the risk of infection and severity as well. Second point, patients with diabetes and coexisting heart disease or kidney disease need special care. An attempt should be made to stabilize a cardiac renal status. Third, and we'll talk a little bit about this, attention to nutrition and adequate protein intake is important. I agree with that and we'll talk about that. Any deficiencies of minerals and vitamins needs to be taken care of especially vitamin D, where there is some suggestion that it may help. Exercise has been shown to improve immunity, though it may be prudent to be careful and avoid crowded places like gymnasia or swimming pools. It's important to take influenza and pneumonia vaccinations. All these points I have already covered. Uh, when sick with a viral infection, people with diabetes do face an increased risk of ketoacidosis, um, uh, especially people with type 1 diabetes. DKA can make it challenging to manage your fluid intake and electrolyte importance, and therefore uh, it, uh, you may uh, go into sepsis if you're not careful. Sepsis and septic shock are some of the most serious complications uh, that which people with COVID-19 have experienced. So you have to be generally careful with a diabetic patient if they develop COVID-19 uh, infection. Now, are people with type 1 diabetes more prone carry worse prognosis? So far, we're talking about type 2 which comes in older age group. What about type 1? Uh, there is very little data to support that people with type 1 have worse prognosis. In fact, there have been no reports in the literature. Um, I have been in touch with uh, some American colleagues of mine who have treated uh, anecdotally, I've heard of three cases uh, of type 1 diabetes who developed COVID and all of them recovered. So it looks as if type 1, because of the younger age and so on, and they don't have other comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. So probably they are okay. They are less prone. Uh, although we don't know for sure. We need more data. Okay. So what should now come to the advice that you will be giving your patients with diabetes? What should people with diabetes do to prevent COVID-19? First of all, again to repeat, worth repeating, tell patients not to panic. Not to watch too much of news about COVID-19. If you keep on watching that, you'll get brainwashed into thinking that some big catastrophe, life-threatening capacity, I mean, uh, something is going to happen or it's like a world war and so on. I don't think we've reached that situation uh, now and probably will never do that. So uh, tell patient not to panic. 
Now, how, what do you do for prevention? Well, you should do the same thing if you didn't have diabetes. The same principles, social distancing, very, very important because it is normally spread through a droplet infection. So if you maintain the two meter, three meter distance with people, you're probably safe. If you sneeze or you cough, see that you do it into your elbow because the clothes, I believe it doesn't last too long, the, the infection. Whereas on your hands, you will go and immediately, you're not going to touch something with your elbow like that. But with your hands, you're going to go and touch something and then spread it to others, door handles, door knobs, uh, toilet, so many places which uh, you'll go and touch hard surfaces and other uh, tables and any other place, okay? So for that, frequent hand washing. Soap and water is the best. You don't have to use alcohol-based sanitizers. Soap and water, 20 seconds, wash every part of your uh, hand like this, like that, the thumb, the tips of the fingers, put soap, if necessary, wash it, put soap again, second time, wash it up to the wrist. See that you completely take 15, 20 seconds to do this hand washing. This is probably the most effective thing. If you have come in touch with anybody, anything before you eat, before you touch your face, please go and hand wash again. I wash my hands at least six to eight times a day, if not more, especially after this. So I think that's one of the best things that you can do. Should everybody wear a mask? There's a lot of debate about this, but as a doctor, of course, you should be wearing a mask and you should wear a mask to visit a health facility or have a fever, cough, cold, or you're in touch with anyone who has these symptoms, you should definitely wear a mask. Otherwise, even if you're going on the road, there is some evidence coming in from WHO saying that even through airborne for longer distances, it can go and so on. And therefore, it's better that you wear a mask if you're going out anywhere, especially during this lockdown period. In fact, you shouldn't be going out in the lockdown. If you have to go to buy a grocery or something, uh, take extra precautions. Now, what other extra precautions should people with diabetes take? I cannot emphasize uh, you know, too much on the controlling diabetes well. We have discussed it again and again in this webinar. Check sugars often. People don't even check their sugars. In fact, I was in a couple of uh, TV phone-in uh, interviews and you know, callers were phoning. And the general feel I got, and some of them were from Tamil Nadu, the local uh, Tamil channel, some were national channel. But the general feeling I got was that people are doing the opposite of whatever they should be doing. Okay. First of all, they've cut down their exercise completely. They say, I'm at home. How can I do exercise? You can do skipping. You can do spot jogging on the spot. If you just run for four or five minutes, uh, that'll be great. Of course, those of you who are a little more well off and you have a treadmill at home or or something, you're lucky. But even without that, do stretches, do the drill exercises, do pranayama, do yoga, do spot running, you can do skipping, whatever you can do, walking within a room. If you have a terrace, you can walk. If it is safe to walk around your house, you can walk around your house. Whatever you can do to increase exercise, you should do. So exercise they don't do, which you should do. Number two, they start eating all unhealthy foods because they're sitting in the house. This is the time when you're eating more healthy food. Eat more vegetables, green leafy vegetables, all color vegetables, fruits as much as possible. Of course, people with diabetes cannot eat too much fruit, but generally everyone can eat fruit. But people with diabetes, one or two fruits per day. Increase your protein intake. Protein and vegetables and fruit build up your, build up your immunity. Okay, so for that, I'll come to that in a minute. So protein is very important. Cut down on fat, cut down on carbs, take more protein. And of course, check your sugar to ensure good control. For those of you who are using, who have glucometers at home, encourage your patients to use glucometer more often and give you the blood sugar readings. Those of you who already use uh, continuous glucose monitoring, this is another opportunity to see that throughout the day, the sugar is kept under good control. Nutrition, good nutrition practice is eat well, eat slowly, eat on time, eat right, and have a complete balanced nutrition. When you talk about immunonutrition, there's a, something called nutritional immunology. Oh, it's all about building up immune function. We know that diet definitely plays an important role. But we also know that the current nutrient status plays a role. I'll show you in the next slide. But things like alcohol and uh, smoking will decrease your immune function. 
Exercise will improve your immune function. Stress will decrease your immune function. So do pranayama. Talk positive things. Always think positive. Your, your stress will go down, immune function will improve. Of course, vaccinations, I already told you about pneumococcal and uh, influenza. Then, hormonal status, age, gender, genetics. These are things which you cannot prevent. Okay? These are things you can't prevent. But all of these you can prevent. If you have some, uh, you know, probiotics, you can take that, it'll build your gut uh, uh, microbiota also. So all these are within your hands and you can actually improve your immune function. A word about malnutrition, okay? Those who are malnourished tend to have uh, more of infections because, first of all, uh, they have nutrient loss, they are negative nitrogen balance, uh, they have um, increased inflammatory status, and they've increased nutritional needs. Secondly, one of the things which uh, we, uh, we know about the symptoms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this one, of COVID-19 is muscle fatigue and general weakness and fatigue. If you are malnourished, you already have fatigue and therefore your symptoms can get worse. Next question comes to, can all anti-diabetic drugs be continued? If there are no symptoms, yes, you can do everything. If you're having symptoms of suspected COVID-19 and you're getting admitted to a hospital, probably makes sense to stop the SGLT2 inhibitors because they can lead to a little bit of dehydration. Maybe temporarily you can stop. I would also say stop the pioglitazone and the thiazolidine dions because uh, they also lead to fluid uh, retention. And besides this ACE2 risk is always there. The sugars are very high, you can start insulin, okay? Next comes to this important hydroxychloroquine thing. Should it be used by everybody with diabetes? Definitely not necessary. Government guidelines say only two things. One, an asymptomatic healthcare worker involved with suspected confirmed case of COVID-19 should take it. Asymptomatic household contacts of COVID-19. These are the only two people who are supposed to be taking hydroxychloroquine. Just take the course which is recommended. First day, two tablets, then one tablet, and uh, you will probably be fine. Although. There is evidence coming in about hydroxychloroquine. It is not confirmed, and I don't think everybody should be using it. Remember, it can lead to toxic side effects, and some people have already died after starting hydroxychloroquine after this COVID-19 started. Uh, a few myths uh, which I would like to dispel. Uh, there is a video going around that just used a hand dryer and a uh, hair dryer, and uh, it will uh, you know, uh, kill all the uh, bacteria uh, and so on. No. Uh, even a hand dryer for the hand is not enough. Washing of the hands with alcohol-based swab is the best. Uh, UV rays cannot kill the virus. Thermal scanners, can it detect everybody with the virus? No, it cannot because only those are having fever. It's not detecting the virus. It's only detecting the fever. Then, should you spray alcohol everywhere or chlorine all over the body? You'll probably die if you do all that. So one should not do all these extreme uh, steps. Is it safe to receive a letter from China? I don't know who's going to send us a letter, but uh, it's probably safe because I don't think it travels via a, all those days staying there. The virus dies in a few hours, especially in tropical uh, climate. Can pets spread the virus? At present, we don't have any uh, evidence for that, uh, but we may give it to them. They may not give it to us. Is there a virus to, is there a vaccine to protect uh, against uh, the COVID-19? No. But it can uh, protect against pneumonia. So pneumococcal vaccination or influenza vaccination can be used. Uh, does rinsing the nose with saline help? No. Does gargling the mouth uh, uh, help? No. Uh, does eating garlic help? No. But uh, I would say three, three things. Garlic, then ginger, and turmeric. These are all things which increase the immunity. So if you're able to do that, it is good. Uh, then does putting on sesame oil block the coronavirus? No, it doesn't kill. Are antibiotics effective in treating? No, antibiotics only treat bacterial infection, not COVID-19. It may treat a secondary infection. Are there any specific medicines uh, to uh, prevent or treat? Well, hydroxychloroquine is there, but I told you, you have to use it with caution. These are general uh, things which you would have heard time and again, but it's worth repeating clean hands with uh, soap and water or alcohol-based uh, hand scrub. Between the two, which is better? Soap and water is better, okay? Alcohol-based hand rub is only temporary. The, core, the soap water gets rid of the virus. So that's even better than only when you don't uh, have, you know, water ready and you're in an office and you have this, 
then you can use it. Or in a doctor's clinic, after seeing every patient, you can use your alcohol-based hand rub. Cover nose and mouth when coughing, sneezing, or uh, sneeze into the elbow. Avoid close contact with anyone who has cold or flu-like symptoms. Thoroughly cook the meat and eggs. So that's the other thing which is asked in several TV programs. Does non-vegetarian eating non-vegetarian will it uh, give you COVID-19? Remember, this came from bats. And in India, generally, we don't eat bats and snakes and rats and so on. Uh, by eating fish, chicken, or uh, meat, there's been no evidence. But still cook it properly because they can carry other infections. Cook it properly, then everything is okay. Avoid unprotected contact with wild uh, or farm animals because we don't know what diseases they have, particularly bats, of course. Uh, so this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to say, yes, people with diabetes uh, do have a little worse prognosis, but this could be because of their older age group and that they already have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, their immune status is not good. They are already in their 70s, 80s, uh, and they have uncontrolled diabetes. If you control your diabetes well, the risk is uh, minimized very much. So focus all your efforts on controlling uh, your patient's diabetes control. This is the message to uh, tell everyone, control your diabetes well. Increase your testing and see that uh, you get your sugars under control. Eat healthy, eat more of vegetables, more of uh, protein, cut down on your carbohydrate, Continue your exercises even if it is at home and generally and most importantly, uh, stay positive all the time. Think positive, speak positive, spread positivity all around because there are people around you who may be scared, who may be depressed. You should be the person who is uh, giving confidence uh, to all of them. We will all be in this together. I wish you all the very best. My prayers and very best wishes to all doctors who are listening to this program because you're doing a yeoman job in continuing to see patients and offering advice either through uh, telephone, teleconsultation or from your clinics or those of you who are on the front line actually managing sick patients. Take care of yourself. Take extreme care. Wear the uh, PPE protective uh, equipment and uh, see that you protect yourself and your family but you're doing a great job. Keep up the great job. This too shall pass. Very soon this will become history. You'll find hundreds of papers coming out on this. You'll find so many human interest stories coming out uh, about this. And soon we'll be having movies and uh, books being written about this. And uh, maybe one time we will tell our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren that we also lived through the COVID-19 and uh, still lived to tell the tale. And I'm sure these are very interesting. They are difficult times through which we are passing uh, through, but I'm sure uh, we will all come out. And until then, stay positive, take care, and don't spread any panic. Don't get into any panic situation. And above all, look after your patients well. All the very best from me. Thank you for listening.